Tonight, breaking news as we come on. Vladimir Putin has ordered troops into Ukraine. The Russian president sending what he calls peacekeeping forces into eastern Ukraine after formally recognizing the independence of two breakaway regions there. In a fiery speech, Putin accusing Ukraine of genocide and calling the country a, quote, puppet of the U.S. and the West. World leaders, including President Biden, denouncing the major escalation, the sanctions just announced by the White House. Also tonight, 25 million Americans Americans under winter alerts across the country, blizzard-like conditions in the upper Midwest, a multi-car pileup shutting down a highway in Pennsylvania, dangerously cold temperatures now moving in, and the South bracing for large hail, damaging winds, and possible tornadoes. Children trapped. The dramatic body cam footage as police rush to save two young children from a burning apartment building, the hero bystander putting his own life on the line to get them out. Falsely accused, the video showing a 13 year old taken into custody after she was accused of making threats against her school. The young teen spending nearly two weeks in a juvenile detention center, but it turns out her classmate made the threat while pretending to be her online. The lawsuit now against the school district and Facebook. Plus the shocking moment a semi-professional hockey player body checks then knocks out a referee mid-game. The swift action from the league tonight and the 500-pound intruder on the loose. The major effort launched to trap a massive black bear ransacking a California community. Meet Hank the Tank. Top story starts right now. And good evening. Making his move, we begin top story tonight with a major escalation by Vladimir Putin after weeks of mounting tension between Russia and Ukraine. Putin now ordering what he calls peacekeeping troops into eastern Ukraine after formally recognizing two territories there as independent. The regions have been controlled by Moscow-backed separatists since 2014. At the White House, President Biden meeting with his national security team today and speaking to the leaders of both France and Germany before announcing new economic sanctions against Russia. And just in, the U.N. Security Council holding an emergency meeting tonight to address the crisis. Let's get right to Richard Engel, who is in Ukraine again for us tonight. From his desk in Moscow, President Vladimir Putin tonight further divided Ukraine by carving off a peace for two of his allies. He recognized the independence of Donetsk and Luhansk, two Russian-speaking enclaves which have been ruled by pro-Russian forces for eight years. Russia already has several thousand troops there. Ukraine is not just a neighbor, Putin said. It is an integral part of our history, culture, and spiritual space. The leaders of the two breakaway enclaves later appeared socially distanced at desks next to him. Putin saying they'd asked him to intervene and that Russia could not sit back and watch what he called a genocide by the Ukrainian government against the regions. Putin now ordering more Russian troops to go into those areas as peacekeepers and delivering this warning to the Ukrainian government. Stop combat activity, he said. Otherwise, the responsibility for continuing the bloodshed will lay on the shoulders of the Ukrainian regime. The Ukrainian government has not been carrying out a genocide, but wars can be launched by lies. Russia today claimed Ukraine has begun directly attacking Russian territory. It offered no proof, except for what looked like a shack Russia says was targeted by Ukrainian forces. In the trenches over the past 48 hours, we have seen absolutely no evidence that Ukrainian troops are in the midst of an offensive against Russia or are preparing for one. Instead, commanders say they have been under fire from Russian-backed separatists and acknowledge that they do fire back at them. I can't help but I get the feeling just being here talking with you, listening to the incoming rounds, that these are historic moments, that we could be at a turning point. Does it feel that way to you? Yes, I agree, the commander said. This is a historic moment and maybe a breaking point. Tom, in many ways, this move was predicted. U.S. officials had been calling it out, but that didn't stop Putin from doing it. What he did today was take something of a middle ground. He didn't declare war on Ukraine, as some in this country feared that he would. Instead, Russia took over an area that it already controls, which is far less than Russia has the capability of doing. But Tom, was this just the start? Was this just Putin's first bite? 
All right, we'll have to wait and see. Richard, for, for us tonight, staying with the crisis in Ukraine and the U.S. response, the president convening his National Security Council for an all-hands-on-deck meeting, the Biden administration keeping the door open for a meeting between President Biden and Putin if Russia doesn't invade. This as the White House imposes new sanctions. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander joins us now live here on Top Story. So, Peter, I have a lot of questions to get to. I want to start, though, with some reporting that's just been confirmed that President Biden ordered sanctions. What do those sanctions impact and what further measures could we see? Yeah, well, that's right. So the White House says that President Biden is going to slap limited economic sanctions on the two separatist regions for now. Basically, it bans any U.S. investment of any kind in those areas with additional steps targeting Russia coming tomorrow. So, so far, the U.S., the U.N. and others are blasting Russia's move, Tom, as a violation of international, uh, international law. We heard from the European Union as well. They said that they would be announcing sanctions of their own. The U.K. saying it's going to detail sanctions against uh, Russia tomorrow. As you noted, today we saw just a, a parade of top security, national security officials arriving here. The vice president, the joint chief of staff, chairman, the defense secretary, the secretary of state, all coming in for a national security meeting that took place for the second day of, in a row in the Situation Room. The president also, as you said, spoke by phone with Ukraine's president and those European allies. And U.S. officials have now expressed new worries, Tom, about President Zelensky, the Ukrainian president's own safety, that they've urged him to leave Kiev if Russia invades. One of those plans, according to Two sources familiar with the discussions would have him relocate to a city in western Ukraine near Poland, where most U.S. embassy operations are now taking place. Yeah, it speaks to the seriousness of the situation. We're going to talk about that a little later in the broadcast. I want to ask you about something because I want to know where the White House's head is at on this. We know President Biden has agreed in principle to meet with President Putin, yeah. but that was barring any type of invasion. It might be semantics, but it might not be if you leave in eastern Ukraine. If those peacekeeping forces enter those eastern Ukraine provinces, is that not an invasion? Well, to be very clear, the White House has said that if any Russian troop enters anywhere in Ukraine, those provinces included, that that would be what they view as an invasion. We just heard tonight from the, the former ambassador to Russia from the United States, Mike McFall, who said to call them peacekeepers is to use Russia's language. They are soldiers, and that is an invasion. So the bottom line at this point, to be clear, is the U.S. said that this meeting happening between Putin and Biden was contingent on there not being an invasion. Tonight, top administration officials have repeatedly said to us that an invasion still appears imminent. The White House said it was open to that face-to-face -face meeting with Putin if they thought it could help de-escalate the crisis so far. Obviously, Russia's only moving forward with its aggressive actions, Tom. And right now, it still remains unclear whether the Secretary of State from the U.S., Antony Blinken, will go back to Europe this week for his scheduled meeting with his Russian counterpart. Yeah, scheduled for later this week. And that's a good clarification, Peter. Those peacekeepers, as Russia calls them, no doubt, are troops. Peter Alexander for us tonight. Peter, thank you. A lot of fast-moving developments today. I want to bring in NBC News military analyst General Barry McCaffrey. He's a retired four-star general and a former National Security Council member under President Clinton. General, thanks so much for joining Top Story tonight. If Russian tanks roll into these regions for what the Kremlin wants to call peacekeepers, we know they're, they're Russian troops, does that count as an invasion? Oh, of course. This is a political charade that Putin rolled out. A few days ago, the Duma gave him legislative authority to declare these regions independent. Today, we saw this orchestrated uh, fake cabinet meeting where they all uh, urge Putin to take the action. Then he hears from the two separatist leaders who agree he should take action. Then he signs the action. And a few hours later, he tells us peacekeepers are going in. The key, Tom, in the coming few days is, will these peacekeepers with tanks, self-propelled artillery and infantry bimps, will they grab the entire two provinces? The bulk of the Ukrainian armed forces are actually in that region. If they do, and I think they will, there'll be a big fight. This is step one to the eventual absorption of Ukraine back into Mother Russia.
So trying to predict what Russia and Putin would do is not a perfect science. We know that by now. U.S. intelligence, the White House has sort of been all over the map with what Russia exactly would do. But to President Biden's credit, and he got a lot of heat for this, he, he initially said there could be a minor incursion. He was attacked for using the word minor incursion. That looks like that's what this could be. General, is your sense that Russia could possibly take Ukraine piece by piece? Or do you see after this move an all-out blitz to, to sack Kiev? Well, we've heard the president and Secretary Blinken both say there will be an all-out assault, air, ground, sea, uh, encircling Kiev, a city of, you know, three million people. Uh, so that's what U.S. intelligence is saying. I find that hard to believe. It's such a strategic disaster for Putin and the Russian armed forces if they pull it off. There'll be millions of refugees uh, throughout Europe. There'll be tens of thousands of casualties uh, so I'm not yet sold on that. But what we are seeing is step one. This is clearly the Russian armed forces intervening and taking sovereign territory from a neighbor. And, uh, you know, I think these are perilous times. Uh, Putin's a risk taker. He's a clever thug who murders his opponents domestically and abroad. He's attacked and seized Crimea. He sees the eastern Ukraine. Uh, he's uh, had combat in Syria. He's annexed essentially part of Georgia. Uh, this is an aggressive, dangerous uh, political actor. General, you heard Peter report there that the Biden administration and Ukrainian government officials have discussed plans to get President Zelensky, the leader of Ukraine, out of Kiev and relocate him to western Ukraine near the Polish border, where the U.S. embassy, I think, is currently housed right now, a Ukrainian embassy. So what do you think would happen if the Russians did get their hands on Zelensky? Well, he'd end up behind bars would be a, a good outcome for him for, and disappear as a political actor. Uh, by the way, I don't find this a, a compelling issue. The least of Zelensky's and Ukraine's problems is whether his personal body could be the government in exile. Personally, I think our embassy ought to be in Kiev still, uh, doubled in size, and Zelensky probably ought to stay at his post along with his other senior leadership and try and mitigate the potential peril facing Ukraine. So we shouldn't be talking about him escaping to Poland. He ought to be at his place of duty. All right, General Barry McCaffrey for us tonight on the ongoing crisis with Ukraine. And we will have much more on Ukraine later in the broadcast. But we want to switch gears now and focus on the weather. Back here at home, blizzard-like conditions impacting millions out west to start this holiday week. But first, over the weekend, snow squalls. Take a look at this, slamming the northeast, creating treacherous wide-out travel conditions. In Pennsylvania, heavy snow and high winds causing a massive pileup involving almost 50 vehicles and shutting down parts of a major interstate. NBC meteorologist Michelle. Michelle Grossman joins us now for the latest on the forecast. So, Michelle, walk our viewers through the next several days. I will. Hi there, Tom. Great to see you. And we have sort of a one-two punch. So a new week, a new storm. And we're going to see two storms rolling through this week. And this storm that we're talking about now has a clear cold side and a clear warm side. So let's start with the cold side. That's snow and also really frigid temperatures. So 25 million Americans impacted by some sort of winter weather alert. You can see it spread across the West, from the Northwest to the Rockies, the Northern Plains, and also the Great Lakes. White is your winter weather advisory. Winter storm watches in your blue. And then we have a winter storm warning, even an ice storm warning. Ice will be a concern, too, over the next several days. So frigid behind this cold front, we're looking at wind chills as low as 35 below zero. So winter is definitely still in full effect. Where you see that dark pink there, that's your wind chill warning. Now, as far as the snowfall forecast, we're generally looking four to six inches, some spots up to eight inches. And then even in the highest elevations of Colorado, Utah, Arizona, seeing up to a foot of snow. Then there is a warm side. We're talking about very warm air. Some spots in Texas, 90 degrees tomorrow, also humid. So that's going to fuel the chance for some storms overnight tonight. We could see really gusty winds, damaging winds, with winds gusting to 60 miles per hour. Also some hail and a few tornadoes. Where you see that yellow tonight, Springfield, Tulsa, down to north of Dallas. That's where we're most concerned. And then tomorrow, 9 million at risk. It sort of shifts to the east where we're looking at Poplar Bluff, Memphis, Greenwood, Nashville, under the gun for some severe weather. Also, lots of rain, too, one to three inches in a very short amount of time. So, Tom, we could see some flooding rains as well. Back to you. Okay, Michelle, we thank you for 
that. We've spent months reporting on the crime problems here in the New York City, and now people are reeling from a weekend of violence on the subway. Multiple stabbings occurring just days before a new subway safety plan was set to go into effect this morning. Critics saying the initiative misses the mark. Now New Yorkers are wondering whether those safety measures are long overdue or go too far. Sinclair SMR has more. Tonight, six people stabbed in New York City subway system in just three days, all before Mayor Eric Adams' new subway safety plan began Monday morning. The six victims all survived, and their attacks spanned the subway system. Crime on the subway is not new, but how has the atmosphere changed in 2022? Well, crime on the subway is absolutely not new, and it's something that we've seen come back in big numbers. On Friday, police say a man was slashed in the forearm on a southbound train. The suspects fled. By Saturday, at least four attacks, according to police, including a 45-year-old man stabbed during a 3 a.m. robbery. No arrests were made. In Brooklyn, a 20-year-old woman was punched and stabbed in the stomach. Police still searching for this suspect. And officials say a man was stabbed in the leg and arm. No arrests have been made. Further uptown, police say a 74-year-old man was stabbed after teens attempted to rob him. Two teenagers were arrested and charged. Just 30 minutes later, at a Washington Heights station, a man was stabbed. His assailants not yet arrested. On Sunday, a six-person was stabbed on a train right here on Canal Street. Police say the attack was unprovoked, but for many New Yorkers, this spike in crime does not go unnoticed. Do you feel safe? Um... Honestly, no. Do you feel safe riding the train in New York? Um, at the moment, not really. Why? Um, especially like on the L line, I've been hearing lots, a lot of like incidents, like stabbings and people pushing each other in front of the trains. It's gotten very eerie. And I think at the beginning of the pandemic, there were a lot of attacks on women. And then now it's all you hear. And it's not just stabbings. All of a sudden I hear, uh, like somebody got hit in the head with a almost halfway empty bottle of water. And I'm like, turn around and my daughter and he's screaming and crying, getting up off the floor. On Thursday, police say this four year old was punched in the head in Times Square. That suspect now facing multiple charges. It's almost like that and I fell on my head and my head is hot right here. According to the NYPD, major crimes are up 46% this year over last with transit complaints nearing 4,000 in 2021, up 15% from the year before. In response, the subway safety plan. We will accomplish what New Yorkers deserve, and that is a safe ride on our subway system at the same time, recognizing the very real humanitarian crisis that has been unfolding before our eyes. The plan creates subway response and outreach teams to address homelessness and mental health, increased NYPD presence, and rules of conduct enforcement, which include no lying down or littering. Nobody should live in the subways. Subways are not a home. What's your reaction to people who hear about this new safety plan and say it's harmful for the houseless of New York? Well, number one is there, there, part of this plan needs to include a long-term sustainable approach to housing. You can't just say, oh, let's get people out of the subway. Where are they going to go? That's cruel. So the fact that there's funding, that there's money, a commitment by the governor, that there's a commitment by the mayor to invest in housing, to invest in support services. Whatever kind of outreach is being done, it needs to be backed up with permanent housing, with permanent health care solutions that actually address the problem so there isn't a revolving door. City officials say. And so in the wake of the pandemic, you know it, we all see it, the number of homelessness of individuals have increased substantially. I'm all for Mayor Adams. I hope it works. I, I want help for the homeless. At the same time, I think everyone wants to feel safe. Who doesn't want to feel safe? Zinclay Asamoah joins us now from New York City. Zinclay, so it was interesting. You started the story there and you, and you asked that person outside the subway that, you know, crime is nothing new in New York City. But I think what is new is that it's gotten to this point where there's a spike and nearly every single person you talk to, I think every person you talk to, didn't feel safe in the subway. That's a huge step back for the city of New York. 
Absolutely, Tom. It is. And overall, the sentiment is uneasiness, right? I spoke with a man who said he's spent his whole life in New York, but he's never felt as unsafe as he does now. We're right now in front of Canal Street, and there was one young woman who frequents this stop. And when I told her there was a stabbing here yesterday, her eyes got wide. She says she no longer rides the train alone. The NYPD added that in addition to the cases we just covered, a woman was hit with a steel metal pipe earlier today. The suspect in that case remained on the train. And I think that speaks to the overall anxiety that so many people have about the fact that these suspects often are not being arrested. So while the safety subway pl uh, plan is a first step, Tom, it's not uh, necessarily enough in the eyes of many New Yorkers. Yeah, Tom. yeah, and New Yorkers will never find this acceptable. All right, Zinclay, thank you so much for that. We want to turn out of gas prices at an eight-year high. The crisis in Ukraine pushing prices to their limit as small businesses and everyday Americans grapple with the rising costs. Here's NBC's Tom Costello. The Ukraine showdown may be a world away, but the oil market is global and prices are already jumping at the pump. The national average now the highest since 2014 at 3.51 a gallon, up 20 cents in a month, up 88 cents from a year ago. California, with its higher gas taxes, now averaging 4.72 a gallon, 4.82 in the Bay Area. We've been taking a lot of family walks, that's for sure, bike rides, but not a lot of traveling going on right now. In Greensboro, North Carolina, Pepper Moon Catering has eight vans constantly on the road. They may have to increase delivery fees. Our vans normally cost an average of like 40 to 60 bucks to fill up, and obviously that's increased up to around like the 50 to 80 range. Russia is the world's third largest oil producer. Experts warn that an invasion, sanctions, and counter sanctions could push gas prices to an all time high. I think that combined with the seasonal ingredients would push the national average up beyond the $4 a gallon mark. It's simply just a matter of time. Potentially pushing $6 a gallon in California. U.S. home heating bills are also surging. Saudi Arabia does not want to pump more oil than already promised, as the U.S. fracking industry also has resisted White House pressure to produce more. Now a group of Democrats wants to suspend the federal gas tax to save Americans 18 cents a gallon through year's end. Gasoline for cars is an essential for certain basic living requirements. And that's why the federal government should be suspending this gas tax. All right, Tom joins us now from Bethesda, Maryland. Tom, let's pick up where you left off there. There's talk of suspending the gas tax, which could save Americans on average a few bucks after they fill up their car. But what is it currently being used for? It's being used to maintain, to rebuild uh, bridges and roads. And as you know, they are in a dilapidated state nationwide. Now, Senator Blumenthal says, listen, we just passed a trillion dollar infrastructure bill. That money is going to go to building out bridges and roads. We can suspend the gas tax for a while because it's not like that work is going to stop. And then he believes 18 cents a gallon really matters to people. And Tom, I know you reported this tonight, but I want to make sure our, our viewers don't forget this. A lot of this stuff is already baked in the uncertainty with Ukraine and Russia into the gas prices. But if there's an invasion and then sanction after sanction, you're reporting tonight that we could see all time highs for gas. Yeah, and that would be anything over about 420 a gallon as the national average. That could be in sight. Keep in mind, out in California, they're already well pushing $5 a gallon. They could push $6 a gallon. But, Tom, the concern is this thing could get out of control. You could have sanctions and counter sanctions. And before long, we start to have real economic drag really hurting, especially small business owners nationwide. Tom Costello for us tonight. Tom, thank you. Now to a dramatic rescue caught on police body cam. Officers responding to the scene of a blazing apartment fire in Arizona. Two little kids were trapped inside. Officers rushing to save them, but it was a heroic bystander who got there first. NBC's Guad Venegas has this incredible video. The kids are in here. Get a ladder. A chaotic scene as officers desperately scramble to get a toddler and a six-year-old trapped inside this apartment building in Mesa, Arizona. <laughs> After using rocks to break the window, the officer hears the children screaming moments before being told they were trapped. Where's that? Where's that? 
They're in the back room. As the fire grew, the two men arriving from a next door car wash jump into action. We need water in this furthest west window. We got babies. One of them using a shed to get up and enter over broken glass and through the second floor window, putting his life on the line. I got it, I got it, I got it. Go, 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 go. Come on, baby. Come on. Moments later, the officer is heard speaking to the man who appears to climb back inside to rescue the second child. Let me see. Let me see. Give me the baby. <laughs> and I got the girl out. Male is now coming out as well. <laughs> Get on out, boss. The hero escaping the flames just in time. Okay. There was so much smoke, you couldn't see, couldn't see anybody or anything in front of you. It was just completely grayed out. The officers recognizing the man who jumped inside. Hand up to the to the citizen who was back there. He was at the car wash minding his own business. He helped save two kids' lives today. The Good Samaritan choosing to remain anonymous, but the heroic actions on video for the world to recognize his bravery. All right, Guad joins us now. That citizen definitely deserves some type of award. We know uh, those two, do you know how those two young children are doing tonight, Guad? And, and was anybody else injured? Because that fire looked kind of intense at times. Right, so the two young children were taken to a hospital and have since been released, so that's very good news. Uh, in addition, Tom, four of the officers were treated at the hospital and have also been released. Uh, we also know that authorities think uh, that fire initially appeared to be started by uh, something that was electrical and is now under investigation. All right, Guad Venegas with that incredible video tonight. Guad, thank you. Still ahead tonight, the train derailment in Arizona. Hazmat crews on the scene after train cars carrying a solvent went off the rails. The warning for residents in the area tonight. Plus, the deadly shooting at a popular restaurant in Tulum, Mexico. And the 13-year-old arrested after police say a classmate pretended to be her online and threatened their school. The lawsuit tonight that places blame on both the school district and Facebook. Stay with us. Top story just getting started on this Monday night. All right, we're back now with a concerning development in a South Florida school shooting threat. Police say that a 13-year-old originally charged with making threats against her school last year was framed by another student. The family is now suing the school and Facebook. Vaughn Hilliard has more. Parents from Renaissance Charter School in South Florida shocked. That's, that's kind of crazy. After police admitted they arrested and incarcerated the wrong student in connection with threats against the school on social media. They should have really done more investigation before they accused and sent someone to jail, especially a minor. That student, Nia Williams, spent 11 days in a juvenile detention center last November. All the while maintaining her innocence. On the date of arrest, our investigation and assessment of available evidence suggested that the person arrested was indeed responsible for the crime that was committed. That evidence threats to blow up the school and kill people on social media. Messages sent from an Instagram account in her name. Authorities later discovering that account was fake and created by another student. The actual suspect maliciously impersonated another student created email and Instagram accounts to send herself as well as other students threatening messages and intentionally lied to law enforcement and school staff to frame another person. The family of Nia Williams is now suing the school district and the social media company Meta, saying this incident was part of a larger pattern of bullying against her daughter that the school and the social media giant didn't address. They plan to eventually include the police department in the lawsuit. To be honest, at first when the officers told me um, it's her and we have evidence, I was so against her, you know, and I felt bad knowing that it wasn't her. A spokesperson for Renaissance Charter School responding, our highest priority remains the safety and security of our students. We always have and always will take all the appropriate actions to ensure our students and staff are safe. We are not at liberty to discuss any private student issues and we do not comment on pending litigation. Representatives for Meta did not immediately return a request for comment. 13-year-old Nia, now cleared of all charges, is still feeling the effects of being falsely accused. I feel distanced, like I really don't want to talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. 
Can't imagine what that's like, just 13 years old. We heard in the story there that Mia has been cleared, though, of all the charges. Do we know what happened to the other child and, and if they're going to face any charges? Exactly. It took the police more than a month to finally subpoena those IP addresses to confirm that, in fact, it wasn't Mia. That 12-year-old, she's now, as a result, facing serious charges, including written threats to kill or do bodily harm, falsifying police report, disruption of educational institution, criminal use of personal information. Again, she allegedly lied about her own role in one of those messages even came from her to herself. This wow. is it's, it's something and it's unfortunate for this 13. Yeah, it really is. All right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed and we begin with the arrest and the murder of a college student in upstate New York. This is really a horrible story. 31-year-old Michael Snow, you see him there. He's been charged with the shooting death of Elizabeth Howell. 21-year-old was found shot on the side of the road near SUNY Potsdam. Howell was a member of the school's prestigious music program and was set to graduate this year. No word yet on a motive. Hazmat crews are on the scene of a train derailment in Arizona. 20 cars of a Union Pacific train going off the rails about an hour south of Phoenix. Authorities say one of the cars was hauling a solvent and spilled after the crash. Crews are working to clean up the material. Residents nearby are also warned of a possible gas leak caused by the derailment. So far... No injuries reported. All right, we want to continue our Ukraine coverage now tonight with an inside look at Vladimir Putin's strategy. As we mentioned earlier, the Russian president speaking for more than an hour today. That speech followed by a tidal wave of misinformation from state media suggesting conflict had already begun. But many in Russia's capital still holding out hope the country avoids war. Keir Simmons is in Moscow tonight. Three. With Russian troops surrounding Ukraine, Tonight, President Putin speaking without notes for almost an hour on national television. Uncompromising, capping a day he clearly choreographed, holding court as advisers on his Security Council dismissed U.S. allegations that Russia will attack Ukraine as war propaganda, urging him to recognize pro-Russian breakaway regions Donetsk and Luhansk as independent territory which he did late tonight, the stage management even extending to a fireworks display minutes later in Donetsk. Those breakaway regions inside Ukraine are seen as a powder keg. Located along the Russian border, over three million people live there. They speak Russian and hundreds of thousands already hold Russian passports. Russian state television airing a tsunami of propaganda, at times sounding like conflict has already begun. But on the streets of Moscow, Russian people we spoke to still hoping to avoid war. Do you think there'll be a war in Ukraine? I love Russia. I love Ukraine, uh, peace of peace. You want peace? Yes. I think it, it is not uh, in the interests of Russia and in, it is not in the interests of USA. All right, Kier joins us now from Moscow tonight. Kier, I know you have some new reporting coming from the Russian side. That's right, Tom. Developments are coming fast, even as these reports tonight that Russia is now sending what it's calling peacekeeping troops into eastern Ukraine. We're seeing uh, the treaty that has been signed by President Putin and is due to be approved by the Russian Duma, the, the Russian parliament. Inside that treaty, Tom, is plans for Russian military bases inside eastern Ukraine. So that's Russian open military encampments in that part of Ukraine that was formerly Ukraine. And I think that really demonstrates that what we're talking about here is more than just a recognition of those separatists in eastern Ukraine. This is, a, is an annexation of eastern Ukraine. I should say, Tom, that there are Western officials who are saying today that they believe there are elements of the Russian military and security services who actually harbor very serious doubts about the potential for a invasion of Ukraine by the Russian military. But we're not there yet. At the moment, the Russians are simply talking about sending in peacekeepers, that would have been unimaginable even a year ago, but now it appears that it's happening. Yeah, when we talk about Russian peacekeeping forces, we are really talking about an occupation, and we'd have to see if it ends there with those uh, states on the eastern side of Ukraine. Kira, you know, we shouldn't be surprised by any of this, because you and I were talking earlier, you know, when you sat down with Vladimir Putin for that wide-ranging interview that made international headlines, this was back in June of last year, he sort of showed his hands a little bit, right? He showed his cards that he was thinking about Ukraine, that it was clearly on his mind. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he already had troops around the border, had had troops around the border of Ukraine. Listen, Tom, these are long-standing grievances from uh, President Putin. One of the indictments that you could lay against uh, Western leaders uh, and even uh, the, the uh, Washington leaders in Washington is this, that, in fact, uh, President Putin has been flagging that this is something that he is deeply aggrieved about for a very long time, even going back uh, 15 years. Many think that he's been, prepare, been preparing for this, even building uh, Russian reserves in order to create a kind of economic fortress against sanctions. So it is not surprising, and you're right, President Putin even flagging it to me in that interview last year. Keir Simmons with a lot of new reporting out of Russia tonight for us. Keir, we thank you for that. All right, now to top stories. Global Watch and the deadly shooting at a resort in Tulum. Police say two men were shot and killed while eating at an upscale restaurant that is popular with tourists. A 24-year-old man was also injured. Authorities say the attack is linked to an ongoing feud between rival gangs. And the search for survivors tonight after a man was found alive on board a burning ferry off the coast of Greece. Video shows the 20-year-old truck driver leaving the ship. He was taken to the hospital for observation, but is said to be in good condition. The Italian-owned ferry was carrying nearly 300 people when it caught fire on Friday. Crews now searching for about a dozen people. That survivor telling authorities he heard voices below deck. Now to our series, Power and Politics, where we take a look at the latest developments in Washington and beyond. Any day now, we can expect President Biden to name a nominee to fill the spot of Justice Stephen Breyer on the Supreme Court. Sources telling NBC News interviews for that position have begun, and the White House confirming the president is on track to name a nominee for the U.S. Supreme Court by the end of February. I want to bring in a professor of law at NYU and NBC News contributor, Melissa Murray, for us. She's going to help walk us through the next several weeks. So, Melissa, I want to start by asking asking you about this interview process. What exactly happens when the president meets with these candidates? Does he literally take Supreme Court cases and, and, and gives the decisions and says, what is your opinion on this? Tom, I think every president may take a different tact with this, but what we do know is that this is perhaps the most high-stakes job interview of these women's lives going on right now. So the president will likely ask things that are going to be very important to him going forward, um, what this person's judicial philosophy is, how they approach the process of deciding cases, um, their experience. Uh, the experience of these prospective nominees is quite varied. Um, Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson has been a district court judge and a circuit court judge. Leandra Kruger has been in the Solicitor General's office and it has been an associate justice of a state Supreme Court. And Judge Michelle Childs has been a corporate litigator and a district court judge in South Carolina. So different kinds of judicial experiences, and I think he'll be probing all of that. But this isn't just about experience and professional acumen. It's also, I think, a bit of fit and sort of understanding what this nominee will bring personally to the bench when she takes her seat. And so it's my understanding that when presidents have met with their nominees in the past, they've asked a lot of questions, not just about cases and case law, but about the nominee herself, about her past, her family, the things that have shaped her going forward. Um, Judge Stephen Breyer, for example, um, he met twice with President Clinton, once for the slot that ultimately went to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And apparently, then Judge Breyer was recovering from a bicycle accident and wasn't able to perform quite as well as he wanted to. The slot went to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and Breyer later had a chance to have a massive do-over where he performed a lot better and ultimately won the nod. But, Melissa, Democrats can't make a mistake here. It has happened in the past where a president picks a justice, and they're not exactly with the same sort of politics or the same sort of values that that commander-in-chief may have. So my question to you is, how can President Biden make sure he's picking someone who definitely will side with the liberal side of of the Supreme Court. I think that's exactly what many of the past Supreme Court nominees have been vetted for. Um, President Trump's nominees were picked precisely because they did not want any wobbly conservatives. Um, no more suitors was a rallying cry around the GOP for many years. So the three Trump appointees were stalwart conservatives who had strong conservative bona fides and were truly, truly dyed in the wool in the conservative legal movement. President Biden um, may not necessarily have the same range. Um, there's no sort of analog to the Federalist Society on the left, um, not in sort of the sense of grooming candidates. But I think he will be probing uh, the judicial philosophies of these women, looking closely at their records as judges to see where they come out on key issues that will be important to the Democratic base. Finally, Melissa, all the candidates 
candidates you mentioned are black women. President Biden made that promise when he was running for president that he'd appoint a black woman to the Supreme Court. Senator Ted Cruz has had a very strong opinion about this, which she shared over the weekend. Let's take a listen. Well, listen, Democrats today believe in racial discrimination. They're, they're committed to it as a political proposition. I think it is wrong to stand up and say, we're going to discriminate. This administration is going to discriminate. What the president said is that only African-American women are eligible for this slot, that 94 percent of Americans are ineligible. So, Melissa, your take on that? Well, I think this is not the first time Senator Cruz has weighed in on this choice and the president's promise to pick a black woman um, in an environment where black women have historically been overlooked for positions like this. Um, he said earlier that black women represent only 6% of the American populace, and therefore this particular nominee would only represent 6% of the American people. Um, again, the math of that is a little suspect. Um, we've never asked the question whether any of the previous nominees, many of whom have been white men, did not represent 6% of the American populace, did not represent the interests of black women. Um, the idea that someone who is an African-American woman could not speak for the American people, could not have identified or empathy for the issues that face ordinary Americans is absolutely laughable. And to the record, I mean, I think let the record reflect. Um, President Biden has been absolutely wide-ranging in his selection of judicial nominees. And it stands in stark contrast to what we saw during the four years of the Trump administration, where the Trump Trump administration only nominated a single African American to all of the judicial seats that it filled during those four years. So I think I'll take this particular tack. Melissa Murray making her top story debut tonight. Melissa, we thank you for your analysis. I'm sure we're going to have you on again. Again, thank you for your time. Next is some major animal news an all out effort to trap a 500 pound intruder in California. A massive black bear known as Hank the Tank ransacking one community, but authorities are having trouble keeping him in the woods and out of people's homes. NBC's Kristen Dahlgren with that story. Tonight, Lake Tahoe's most wanted, still on the loose. A massive 500-pound black bear nicknamed Hank the Tank, being blamed for dozens of break-ins and causing a fierce battle over his fate. Hank comes into the city to be fed. Hank has quite a reputation in the Tahoe Keys neighborhood. A fish and wildlife spokesperson telling media the bear has damaged dozens of homes, easily smashing through windows and doors in search of food. They're supposed to be hibernating, but they've been so used to people and being fed year round, they don't they don't really do the bear stuff. Wildfires pushed black bears into neighborhoods this summer with lots of food and garbage to snack on. Police officers use everything from uh, sirens to loud noises to shouting at them to beanbags. He's still here. Hank is double the size of an average black bear. Look at the size of his prints next to a man's boot. That's from scoring food easily from uh, people's homes and garages. But with fears a bear as large as Hank could hurt a human, some say euthanasia is the only safe option left. The Bear League has offered to relocate Hank to a sanctuary. We believe he's one of our neighbors and he's only doing what he's been taught to do. We think there's a lot of other options. Social media now chiming in with hashtag Hank the Tank as a community braces for more break-ins and debates what to do about its unwelcome neighbor. Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News. That is one big bear. All right, Kristen Dahlgren for us tonight. Kristen, thank you. Coming up, a member of our Top Story family taking us inside a personal health battle within her own family. Several women in Priscilla Thompson's life diagnosed with uterine fibroids, an often painful condition that affects black women more than others. Priscilla joins us tonight to discuss this physical and often emotional impact it's had on her own mother and herself as well. What she wants other women to know teaches us a lot tonight. Stay with us. Finally tonight, we want to tell you about a medical condition impacting so many women in this country, but particularly black women. Uterine fibroids, benign tumors that can cause debilitating symptoms and prevent pregnancy, impacting one in four black women ages 18 to 30. Tonight, our Priscilla Thompson sits down with her mother to talk about how the condition impacted her. For years, I've had questions about something called uterine fibroids, non-cancerous tumors that can develop during childbearing years. My mom had them, her mom had them, and her mom's mom too, plus all my aunts. My sisters and I wonder if we'll have them too. It's good to see you. Recently, my mom and I decided to talk about it. When did you first hear the word 
fibroids. But I'll never forget one day I was at work and all of a sudden I had this horrible, horrible pain and I ended up going to the emergency room that night. Since she was a teen, my mom struggled with incredibly difficult menstrual cycles, pain that she says was dismissed by her doctors at the time. Well, I had to been about 15. So that was around mm -hmm. the time your cycle started? Yes. Years later in the ER, my mom learned she had fibroids and that one of them had burst. Doctors said her only option was a hysterectomy, removal of the uterus. I was like, no, no, I'm not going to do this. Thinking that maybe it would bypass me, even though my mom had experienced it, my grandmother and my two sisters. And how old were you when you first found out you had fibroids? Um, 36, 37, somewhere in there five years older than me. Instead of having a hysterectomy like all the women in our family before her, my mom decided to live with the symptoms, prolonged periods, heavy bleeding, and pelvic pain for more than a decade. I would say if you had a scale, I would put it at a nine. The cramps were that bad. The bleeding, I mean, it's coming through your clothes, and then I was anemic. I remember you coming home and like just sitting in the room in the dark and in your bed. What was it like for you emotionally. I was very self-conscious. A lot of times I just felt like I would prefer not to even go to work. I would just rather stay at home. To me, that sounds very lonely. It was depressing, but I don't know, it's just like, you just feel like you didn't want to be around people. More than 25% of black women ages 18 to 30 have fibroids. That's compared to only 7% of white women. As black women hit 40, the number goes up to 60% or even higher. That's based on a review of the studies out there. But doctors say research is sparse. The reasons for the disparity are unclear. Doctors say risk factors may include starting periods earlier in life, genetics, and obesity. We suffer in silence oftentimes. Dr. Anika Bell Gray has treated me all of my adult life. She's also my mom's doctor. I remember when I was 18 or 19 coming to you for an appointment and being like, am I going to be able to have kids? Mm. Do you remember that? I do remember. I was worried mm -hmm. and I'm still worried, especially as a black woman in my 30s who would like to have kids one day. Our hysterectomy is the only option. They aren't. Still, because fibroids are often diagnosed so late, black women are almost four times more likely to have a hysterectomy, roughly a third occurring during childbearing years. What needs to change in order to address that and help to eliminate some of those disparities. Rarely do we get into the details of how was your cycle? How long are you bleeding? How do we establish a screening method that actually captures this earlier before it becomes so problematic that now we're talking about major treatment strategies. If I or one of my sisters came to you and said we had fibroids, what would you hope would be different for us? I just hope that there's something else out there and that you wouldn't have to go through what I did. All right, Priscilla joins us now in studio. First off, Priscilla, thank you for sharing such a personal story. I know our viewers are learning a lot, including myself. I, I want to ask you, I your mom said that initially this wasn't diagnosed. I mean, doctors weren't telling her exactly what it was. Why is that? Yeah, so she had painful periods for a very long time, and it was sort of dismissed. And then when she had this sort of fibroid burst, that's when she learned that she had them. And by then, it was so severe that the only option was to get a hysterectomy. And so part of the concern is the need to do more research in the asymptomatic phase to be able to diagnose this before the only option is that hysterectomy. So you said that there were other options. You mentioned that in your story besides a hysterectomy. What are they? Yeah, the doctor that I spoke with talked about things like birth control, which can help to sort of control some of that heavy bleeding, and also other medications that can help uh, to shrink the fibroids and control some of that. But those medications can only be given if it's caught at a certain stage. So, you know, as journalists, we always want to shine a light on subjects, especially especially subjects that people don't know about or things that are underreported. But I'm curious, for you, was this a little bit of both? I mean, did you want this issue out here, but did you also want to get some... some I don't, want to, I don't know if it's closure, but just some facts about the issue? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I'm approaching an age where I'm thinking about having kids and to hear that, you know, my mom found out she had fibroids and would have her uterus removed uh, when she was five years older than me uh, makes me think about my own fertility and what my future might hold. Um, and it was important for me to go back and have this 
conversation with her because I remember as a teenager watching her go through all of this and thinking to myself, is this going to happen to me one day? It, it crushed me hearing about your mom just being by herself in the dark in her bed. She, is this something she couldn't talk about? Yeah. Yeah. And the doctor that I spoke with says this is the case for a lot of women. It's embarrassing. It is an isolating experience. And my mom even told me that when she spoke to her mom about it, she was basically like, you know, this is something we've all had to experience. It's just a part of life. And so to hear my mom say that she hopes for something different for myself and my sisters if we have this condition is really important to me. We hope so, too. And thank you so much for, again, for telling this very personal story. I know that wasn't easy, but I'm sure a lot of people are going to learn a lot. Yeah. Priscilla Thompson for us tonight. Priscilla, thank you. And thank you for watching Top Story. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. More news now on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.